Hey guys, all of our videos lead up to this one right here. We're going to teach you the game design document, or GDD, and why it's so important. Do you want to organize your game to the next level? If so, keep watching because class is in session. Hello everyone, I'm Steel. And I'm Teal. And we're with Studio Blue. Thank you for joining us for our Creator Classroom, where we teach you the basics as well as the theory behind game design as well as writing. What is our topic tonight? Because this is one we've been building up to for a while. Yes, uh, our topic is quite a weighty one. It's the game design document. This is the most important thing you're going to have as a developer. That's right. And as usual, if you're watching us live, please give us a follow and consider subscribing. And if you're watching us on VOT, please smack that like button, ring that notification bell after clicking subscribe, then ring it again. Ring tender it again. Care. With tender it. loving care. Give us a comment. Let us know what you think. So the game design document, um, let's say hello to everybody first. Hello, Griffin, Rack, Nerwanda, and Bert. And everyone else who's working. Ah! What else? <laughs> yeah, some people are, excuse me, <clears throat> as I hawk right into the stream. Some people are watching Hawk. Hawk Zombie. So yeah. people are watching two at once. Hello, humans. So um, this is, we've talked about this time and time again, and this is probably the most important thing you're going to learn when it comes to uh -huh. the documentation and organizational part of your game development. That's right. We cannot overstate enough how important a good GDD is, even if you're going solo. Um, this is a lot of talking, um, and it's a lot of slides. We're going to try to go as quickly as we can without going too fast. At the end of this Creator Classroom, we're going to have a very special announcement, which some of you all are absolutely going to love. Yep. So before we jump any further in, let's actually talk about what to expect tonight. Okay. So what are we going to do? Okay, so first thing, we're going to explain exactly what a GDD is and why you need it. Mm -hmm. We're then going to go over the most common categories that you're going to find in a GDD. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go in depth into each of those categories. Okay. It is, this is a, a organization document. So we're going to show you how to build it and keep it organized. Right. Um, one thing I do want to say as we go into this, a lot of times we're going to talk about uh, linking things because the way we believe mm -hmm. uh, the GDD so the GDD being a single document for everything uh, is in your game however we believe that you should be able to link to external sources right uh, such as spreadsheets right 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 and, and I know I'm jumping around the bullet points here so I want to get that part out of the way right now a lot of people will say hey well I don't need a GDD because I'm a solo developer or I do all my work in a spreadsheet well we don't want you to do your balancing um, you know, and your balance testing in the, in the document. Do it in a spreadsheet and then link that spreadsheet mm -hmm. to your document. Right. Same thing if you have like a directory full of assets. Don't mm -hmm. put all your assets in the document. You're not doing this for a big company where you have to have, you know, tons and tons of concept art. But put your concept art in there. But if you have like a folder full of massive amounts of photos, videos, uh, text, um, not text, uh, textures, uh, just, mm -hmm. you know, visual assets, audio assets, you can link. Yeah. So when we're going over this, imagine in your head, if it would be easier for you to link to an external library, it's okay. And as BG said, yes. Hyperlinks do go a long way. Yes. Yeah. So let's actually go down the bullet list. So first okay. off, what is a GDD? Okay. So it's a single document for everything about your game. And we and mean I everything. I mean everything. All of it. Uh, we also refer to this as the game Bible. Because, like, if you go back to television and movies, they'll call it the movie Bible or the show Bible. Yeah. You know, where it has all the information about the characters, the settings, everything. Games are exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. So what does it contain? Okay. So it's got everything in there, including your formulas. Yes. Yes. And that means you'll have separate spreadsheets. You can, right. You can have spreadsheets or other kind of documents. Just make sure you link them. Right. Into your main GDD document. But if you have a damage formula, 
if you have a random encounter mm -hmm. formula, anything algorithmic that can be expressed mathematically, you're going to want to put that in here along with all the other massive amounts of text we're going to talk about. Right. The idea is that you want your GDD to be a central repository for everything. No, no, Burke, uh, the hyperlinks are to external repositories. Right. Okay. You're, you're not going to want to embed a big spreadsheet into your document. Right. You can have a, you can, especially if you're using like Word or, yeah. or, or something that allows you to do links within your document, you could have like a main menu where you click on this section and it brings you to that section of that document. But what we're talking about are the hyperlinks to external sources. Right. Okay. Um, and it's a living document. Mm-hmm. So let's uh, let's go go forward. By the way, a living document means it's constantly changing over the course of the lifetime of your project. It, it you're never going to stop making your GDD right. ever. All right. So that's what a GDD is. But do you need one? Yes. Yes, you do. Yes. You have got to have something to keep you organized. No exceptions. Okay. And I, I don't care if you're a solo, a team. A, a, a huge company you have got to have a game design document you really do um even if it's a small game then it's going to be a small document mm -hmm. uh some of the games that we've worked on in the past have had our gdds be upwards of 200 pages uh games like your final fantasy 7 remake probably have in the thousands yeah of pages. thousands of pages <laughs> no you can't just throw things at a wall and hope it sticks and and Griffin, um, <laughs> we we ourselves recommend it being Word, but if you're putting your information and not just cells in your GDD, then the spreadsheet can be that. However, as you'll see as we go on, mm -hmm. a spreadsheet doesn't usually have the right um, ability to contain the information. But we'll, we'll see where it goes and then we'll see how you feel at the end. Yeah. Um, but even if you're solo, you have to have some central documentation. Um. So, do you need a fancy template? Because people sell these templates online. They do sell them online. I wouldn't buy one. No, you do not need a fancy template. No. Just use Word or Notepad, yeah. WordPad, okay? Yeah, we, we are, we're actually going to put these slides um, in the, a link to these slides mm -hmm. in the description of this video on YouTube. Uh, so, you can just pull what we use. I mean, yeah. literally just use it. Please don't pay for this. Yeah. Okay. No. What, what the, the thing that matters inside your GDD is all the information right, the about your game, mm -hmm. okay? That's the content that matters, mm -hmm. okay? Yes, you can have organizational applications. Mm -hmm. They can help, but your GDD itself needs to be a, a Word document. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, organization applications can help. So we personally, Teal and I, use a combination of Evernote and MS Word. Mm -hmm. But use anything that allows you to organize your thoughts. Uh, there's Artisy Draft, which you can get off of uh, um, Steam when it's on sale. Right. Uh, you could use Scrivener, technically. Anything, Scrivener, yeah. You know, anything that you can use to organize yourself mm -hmm. is what you're going to want to use for your GDD. And you want to use a, to a tool you're the best with. Yeah. Senior Wanda says, one of the first things I do when starting a new game is make a spreadsheet with formulas. They help with the balancing, right, right. But you want to go past that. You do. You, do. you all want to go past that. Trust mm -hmm. me. In the end, it is a lot of work, but in the end, it is so much better. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's just kind of jump into okay. the most common categories. So what we're going to go through first is uh, the 25 categories. We've broken it into five by five. Yes, we have. We're going to briefly talk about them now, and then we're going to go further into depth as to what they mean. The important thing to note is you don't have to have every one of these, but you should have any that are relevant to your game. Correct. So if you see something here and you go, well, I'm not sure my game would have that, then you can question whether or not that's a category you want to use. Mm -hmm. But we would recommend considering every single one of these. And maybe you'll think of something that goes outside of this. The whole point of teaching an organization class is teaching the basics, the theory, and then you applying what you feel is best for your project. Right. And that's that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. So, uh, without further ado, the most common categories, we'll just start with these five. Yep. Uh, you need a title page. Which is an identifier. That's all that is. Yeah. An overview yes. of, of your game. What just, is just, it? Just a, basically one paragraph overview. Mm -hmm. Then you need to uh, write down the, uh, the story, just the basic outline mm -hmm. of your story and we'll get into how detailed that is in a little bit right then the setting mm -hmm. 
where it's set, and then the characters. Right, which can be anything from your main and your antagonists to all the little people walking around. Yeah. It, it can go as in-depth as you need it to go, and we want you to go in-depth, as you'll see in the details, but first, number two. All right, here are the, the next categories. Uh, gameplay. Right, which is basically how the user interacts with your game. Okay. The, the gameplay loop. The gameplay loop. Right. right. And then the mechanics. Yeah, it'd be things like your physics, you know, the operational parts behind the scenes. That's mm -hmm. where your formulas would go. Exactly. You know? So if you have a damage formula or a random encounter formula or a ghost hunt formula, you would put them in the mechanics section. And then there's those game options. Everything the user has the ability to control from like uh, audio levels mm -hmm. to screen color to font type. All of that would go under game options. You're going to write down what can change. What else is there? Uh, saving and loading. How does that work? All right. Yeah, exactly. And then replay. Which is going to go everywhere from the replayability of your game to new game plus. We'll get to that in a second. Right. Continuing. Continuing with the common categories. Cheats. Mm -hmm. Yes, either intentional <laughs> or paying homage to. Right. Easter eggs. Yep. Tutorial level, because you must have a tutorial level. Right, even if your tutorial is literally just the first couple of seconds of your game. That's fine. You do want to do some kind of teaching. Yeah. And then uh, the all the different game levels. That's so why these are every, all the game levels after you tutorial level. Right, so the reason we use the word repeated is you're going to repeat the section over, over and over. Over and over and over. Many times. And then, of course, your UIs. Right, all of them. Um, and again, if we're going kind of fast, this is the overview part. We're going to go really deep, really We're going to do a deep dive, so yes. don't worry. Moving on. All right. So then you want to have a section on your game engine. Yes, game <laughs> engine. You want to have a section on your game programming. Right. Your AIs. Which we had an entire Creator Classroom on. Uh-huh, we did. Mm -hmm. Game art and your game audio. Both of which we've talked about in depth. And hey, KV, welcome to the welcome stream. Welcome to the stream. Yes, yeah, good to see you. And no, attendance does not affect your grade, just the final exam. Yeah. And All right, last part. more categories. Okay, your technical specs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, your design plan. Now, design plan is not your production schedule. No, not at all. Okay. Design it, plan is different. Different. Yeah. You have your installation and update plan, which is a plan too. Mm -hmm. Then you have your proposed production schedule. Yep. And then your asset lists. Right. Which again, asset lists are not posting all of your access assets in the document. You're allowed to go to an external library. Yes, you are. But let's deeper dive because, well, not only the category's finished and it's a lot, but I think we confused our slime. Uh, the, the, the slime is going to take a break right now yeah. because we just went through like 25 yes. different uh, categories. And now we're going to deep dive let's into Let's do suckers. the deep dive. So here's our deep dive. Get ready because now we're going to be talking for a while. So. Yeah, 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 BG, you're right. Asset list, handy for noting what you've already used put it in the credits absolutely absolutely 100 mm -hmm. <coughs> he did burp yeah poor slime if there's a final half to get pants on <laughs> all right so for each one of these um we're gonna go deeper in um we're gonna be monitoring chat so if you have a question about what we're talking about yes feel free to ask please, we'll go please ask we will be happy mm -hmm. to to address your your questions we'll even go back a slide we will we'll right. go back a slide so let's go okay First one, here we go. So, so that title page, um, that's important just simply because you need to have something. Even if it's a manuscript that no one else is ever going to look at, have something It's identifier. You can easily go, that's what this is. However, if you're going to have investors or teams, it's mm, paramount. You must, they must, because they need to be able to refer to it. Yes. And uh, it's quick and easy. So what information do you put there? Okay, well, obviously you put the game name. Right. And uh, it can be a working title. Yes, it can be. It can be a working Absolutely. title until you have come up with your final title. And you can note it as a working title if you have to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Then you want to have your company or your your solo name. Right. Okay. So who who is developing this? Right. Who is creating this? It'd be the difference between saying um, Studio Blue as opposed to Steel. Right. Oh, hey, Graceless. Welcome to the stream. Ah, Graceless. Well, just Absolutely. Thank you for being so dedicated to educating the gaming community. You are so welcome. Thanks, thank Graceless. you. Graceless. We do our best. We do our best. Um, after that. Okay, then you put your name. In case there's a difference. In case there's a difference, mm -hmm. because uh, this is actually for legal reasons. Right. This is 
yours. Right. Okay. If you're the copyright holder, that's what your name is. Yes. Um, okay. And then, and then uh, the writer's name, if you have a, a partner who's writing, right. who's actually writing the story and everything, they need to be on the title page as well. The writer's name is actually the person who's writing the design document. Okay. And that's in case you hire a technical writer. There are people you can hire for that. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the story writer. That's going to go on your team later. The writer is the person who wrote the DDD. Oh. You can contract out services of technical writers to yeah. write your GDD. Um, it's going to cost you some money, but they'll hopefully, if they're worth it, so I'll give some good stuff. And then lastly, any, any import important licenses that you're going to need. Yes. So yeah. that way they'll know that, hey, if you're doing a Warner Brothers game like Batman, that Warner Brothers Studios, boom, okay. Right. You're good, don't sue us. <laughs> right. It does. It's not 100% correct. It's not. It's, not, it's We're all good. All right. Let's move on. Okay. All right. Here's the overview. Overview pick. Overview. Okay. So let me go ahead and take this one because this is your high level and this is where you start to, this is where you kind of get that, that 10,000 foot view of your game. Sounds good. Do it. Well, you want to have a high concept first, and that's five sentences or less. It's almost an elevator pitch. In fact, if you're going to attempt to pitch this to an exec or an investor in your high concept, you'd also want to write your elevator pitch, which is a, which is a sentence or two. You know, this is where you want to talk about what makes your game unique, what makes your separates your game from everyone else's what the game is on its highest possible level, and why a person would want to play it. Then, yeah, do, 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 do. yes, yeah, that's that's actually very true, Berkleos, um, and scary. Um, but moving on to non-EA things. Um, the summary is going to be about five paragraphs, and I say that just simply because you would have one paragraph as the opening action, uh, one paragraph per act, that's assuming it's a three-act game, and then one for closing. So this is still higher level. You're not getting into the nitty gritty of the story yet. What you're getting into is a summary that if someone said, hey, I liked your pitch, go ahead and send me the summary of your game. You can just copy it right out of your GDD and send it to them in an email. Um, then you want to write down your genre and your target audience. You know, who are you targeting the game? Are you targeting, you know, fans of high fantasy? Um, you know, are you targeting, you know, teenagers ages uh, 12 to 17? Are you targeting older, you know, an older audience? Is it kids only? You have to write that down as well as what the genre is. And I know genre gets a little murky nowadays. You know, like what's an RPG? What's an adventure game? Um, Go with what your gut uh, tells you. If you pitch this to someone else and they say, actually, this game is this and not this, you can always fix it later. Um, then you want to go with the look and feel. So the look and feel is how your game is actually going to look. What's that aesthetic? Is it going to look like a cartoon? You know, that tune shading that like Wind Waker had. Is it going to look hyper realistic like uh, Heavy Rain? You know, um, or um, Beyond Two Souls or Detroit Become Human? Is it, uh, you know, very anime stylized? You know, what's that look and feel? Does it feel like, you know, bright colors and rounded shapes? So you're playing a cartoony game. You know, is it jagged? Is it is it surreal and artistic with pastels? And, you know, you're playing a bird flying through clouds, whatever. That's your look and feel. Um, and again, this is high level. You don't have to go super in depth. Just, you know, give a paragraph or two that gives the reader an idea of what it is. Also, this will help you if you ever start to get off track. And then the external influences, which is going to be the same thing. It's going to help you if you get off track or if someone's looking at your game, either joining in as a team or investing, you want external influences. So that external influences are other games that this is like or properties, other IPs. And this is OK. It's all right if you say, hey, this is like a telltale game. You know, that's all right for you to put that here because this is where you want people to be able to connect what you're what they're playing to something else. You know, if it's like Braid. No, we haven't. Oh, I did. I skipped game flow. Thank you, Noranda. Um, game flow is the flow of the game, how the player plays from point A to point B. Are they playing through a control pad, running through a level and jumping? Um, do they do they explore? Is the game flow uh, going through a map and having random encounters? That would be so it's your not your core gameplay loop. It's the level above that. That's the game flow. Thanks for the catch near. Good job. Back to external influences, list what the game is like. That way someone has a baseline for something else. And then finally, monetization, if there's an in-game monetization model. 
we don't want you to see you do any predatory microtransactions. Or we don't want to see you do loot boxes. But whatever you got, put down monetization. Mm -hmm. If it's, you know, um, aesthetic only, that's fine. Put that's that down. That's fine, yeah. Whatever you have, that's monetization. Probably really big, BG. Yeah, consistency is important. You Very. don't want to mix your, your assets. Yes, yes, exactly. All right. Um, if there's any questions about this, I apologize again for skipping game flow. I'll try not to do that again. Mark says, is the game flow more related to the loop? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's, but it's not the core loop. It's a level above that. Right. Um, anyway, let's move on. Okay. Want to talk about story? Okay. So here's the story. You want to put down your, your backstory first right. because the... The players may not ever really see it, but you need to know that in your head. Absolutely. You need to know mm -hmm. the backstory so that you can help craft the main story. And we talk about that all the time. You have to know everything that happened in the past, and you have to write it. Yeah. This is where you write it. So write it, write it down. Mm -hmm. Then you write down uh, your main story, mm -hmm. okay, from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Then you write down all your different side stories, mm -hmm. okay? And that means each one of them. And that would be things like in Skyrim, that would be every quest line. Mm -hmm. um, every uh, side piece, like the Civil War, would be a side yes, story. Yes, the Civil War is a side story. You know, stuff like that. So side stories are all of them. Not all your side quests, all your side stories. stories. And then you want to uh, make an outline of your story progression. How is the player going to get from the start to the end? Where are the choices? How many are there? Mm -hmm. Now, you're not going to go detailed into choices just yet because there's a section that lets you map out all that. But you want to mention choices here, choices there. Give the reader of the document knowledge that the player is going to be influencing the ending. Right. Um, and then most importantly, everything we just mentioned, all of it, has to be as detailed and coherent as possible. This is where... I got a little something stuck in my teeth. <laughs> this is where you're going to stretch your writing skills or... Hire a technical writer. That's right. Or a creative writer. You know, hire someone to write this. Um, because if you go back and look at it, you need to know what you wrote and what it meant. Also, if someone else is going to help you with the game, they need to know what you're talking about. That's right. The whole concept of this is the more information you give up front, the less questions and confusion you have later. Shall we move on? Let's move on. All right. Okay, the setting. Very important. Ooh, we go yeah. into world building deeply. In fact, mm -hmm. we have five... <laughs> workshops we do on world building and all of that deals with this one section of the gdd right here yeah and bg's uh his story idea for book of shadows was broke 100, broke 100 pages. pages they can be very long yes they can be very very long mm -hmm. and now they're comparing uh gdd sizes right. <laughs> please continue okay so for the setting you want to write down your your overview of the setting the overview is basically you know uh, this takes place in the world of Hyrule, Land of Magic, etc. It is a high-level view of your setting. Very high-level. You're looking down. You know, about one or two paragraphs tops. But it leads directly into... Into your game world. Okay? And uh, that includes all your world building. All of it. Okay. So if you just spent like 200 pages world building, mm -hmm. that's where this goes. Do you see why game design documents can be so big? Because they literally contain... World building documents, story documents, character documents, level design documents. They're all put into one big, huge, massive binder. That's, that's right. That's the GDD. And then also for setting, you want to uh, put down the, the look and feel of your game. What's the aesthetic of your world, right? Right. You know, does your world have those tune colored graphics we talked about? Is it mm -hmm. is it shades of gray because it's very, you know... Um, very noir. Wide. Right. Um, does it have the stark black and white of Unfinished Swan? Mm -hmm. Swan? Swan. So, right. yeah. Uh, your GDDs would grab. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, GDD. yeah. Uh, yes. Uh huh. Uh, also, in the setting, you want to include what your visual, your visual and your aural style or themes are. Mm -hmm. We had a class on that. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be referencing a lot of our classes. <laughs> But it's true, though. Um, these are things we all covered prior to getting into this, because this ties it all together. I mean, for example, let's say you're uh, making a uh, steampunk game. Yeah, exactly. So uh, one of your, your visual themes is going to be gears. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody associates cogs and gears with, with steampunk. steampunk. Yeah. Right. Gauges and stuff. Right. And then lastly, your cinematics. So this is where you would write down how your cinematics are going to happen in accordance with your story that you've already wrote. If there's any variances, you would list them here. 
So if it's standard, you know, third person camera with during a cinematic, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, tight, you know, tight angles in this scene, loose angles in that scene, camera looking up for horror, camera looking down for for uh, romance, you know, just different kind of things. You right. Write it all down as if you were casting a film. Now you don't have to get down to the minutia of the camera movements, but you have to give a general tone for each of the cinematic moments in the game. Right. And you can link it back to your story. So that's where you would say, you know, these scenes, and you list them all, are all have real tight shots with a slight camera angle, you know, a slight yaw to the camera, you know, or a roll mm -hmm. to give it that sense of, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, da -da, you know, a lot of tight shots. Yeah. While these are, you know, wider, so it shows just this, the, the breath of the earth, that kind of thing. Yes. Um, and then you want to list down what those scenes are and how they relate back to the story section. Um, moving on. Moving hmm. on. My thesis was in a triple. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, gosh, yeah. Cool. We're keeping up on chat, guys. Don't worry. Okay. Details. Characters. Mm -hmm. All right. This is where you're going to have all of your characters. All of them. Everybody. That includes NPCs. Do not skimp on any of them. And if you have generic named characters, just write that down, too. Mm -hmm. um, you, We never recommend doing anything less than every character in your game. Yeah. Even if they're not named, and you just have, you know, townspeople of this town, like the townspeople of the town of Generica. Right. And here's all of their information, but you have them listed. You see, and basically, you're going I, to... I get really granular on this. Yes. So, um, if I'm going to have townspeople, I list how many townspeople I'm going to have. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have eight townspeople in Generica. Exactly, exactly. Um, and you want to do this for your main characters? And so then you have mm -hmm. your main characters, your supporting characters, your antagonists, your all your background characters, mm -hmm. NPCs, shopkeepers. What we literally mean is every character in the game. It's anything yeah. that the player can interact with intelligently mm -hmm. and have either a conversation with or kill. You even want your animals on here. Yeah. You know, just they're not going to be able to, to talk, but these are your animals. Animals are characters. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, so now here... For each of these, they have to have a backstory, even if it's a line, you know, yeah. like, uh, this shopkeeper has, this shopkeeper owns the item shop that is open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Right. And that's his backstory. Personality, uh, this shopkeeper is money hungry and doesn't care about his product, uh, quality. Right. Stuff like that. Appearance, what they look like. What they look like. Story connection, what do they connect to? Yeah. What part of the story do they connect to, if any? Mm -hmm. Relationships, how they relate to other characters, or do they have any uh, friends, family, will anyone mourn their death, or will their death not be mourned, shall not be mourned? Yeah. Uh, what abilities do they have? Oh, what that's right. Powers, yeah. What can they do to defend themselves, mm -hmm. if anything? Or do they want to run away screaming with their hands over their head? Exactly. Where are they located? Where are they located? And the schedules, yes, BG, that is exactly if your mm -hmm. character moves. So if there's a either a dynamic time system, a uh, dynamic day and night, or anything like or that. Or anything. You know, if your character does anything other than move along a track, you know, goes to the left, then goes up a little, then moves back down, then goes to the right. If they do literally anything other than that. Yeah. Um, you want to write down what their schedule is. Mm -hmm. you know? Hey, at, at, from this time to this time, he's over here. From this time to this time, he's over there sandboxing. And from this time to this time, he's in bed. That kind of thing. Yes. You write down your schedules for everybody because you will find real quick if you schedule your NPCs and you don't record it, you are going to get conflicts. Yeah, and you will. they are going to be hilariously bad. <laughs> and Boo Boo Hotep, it's good to see you, man. Uh, good to see you. We're going to we're gonna skip your intro this time because we're kind of knee deep in this, but it's always good to see you, my man. All right, um, so that's characters. So that's characters. Yes. Okay, now gameplay. Yes. You want to take this steal? Yeah, I will. So gameplay is, this is how the player interacts with the game. This is the gameplay loop and how it is affected and how it affects everything else. So the progression is going to be broken into sections. The game progression is how they get through each part. Each part of the game. Right, so let's take the uh, first hour or so of Kingdom Hearts, the first one. Uh, you would go dive to heart, and you would break that into a section to describe what that is and how the player plays it. Then you would go with Destiny Islands Day 1, and you would say, you know, how uh, they play Day 1 and what they learn. What is the game teaching them on Day 1 Destiny Islands? Right. Then you would describe the cutscene, and you would reference back to the cutscene in the story section. And then you would say Destiny Islands Day 2 and what they learned there. Um, then you would go to the next set of cutscenes. Then you would go to Night of Fate. And what happens there and mm -hmm. how that works. Now, you're not describing the levels. You're just describing how the player plays it. Yes. 
and then you get to like, you know, the hub in Traverse Town and you're done. So for every section in your game, and uh, this is as they progress through the, the main story, the, the game itself, you gotta have how they go through it. And then you wanna tie that into the next section, which is objectives. So the objective for a guy to dive to heart is, you know, choose the sword, the wand, or the shield, uh, then reject the wand, the sword, or the shield, um, talk to uh, Titus, Selfie, and Waka, determine your game speed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I can't believe I remembered all that. But that's your <laughs> objectives, and you want to do that for every section. Yeah. And then you have your mission structure. Yes, which is how missions are structured. Mm -hmm. Missions are quests. And all, all the mission or a quest is ever, depending, regardless of what the game calls it, is the moment-to-moment -moment objective that pulls a character through the main narrative. Right. So a mission can be as simple as go into the house and uh, find a way into the house. That's a mission. Mm -hmm. The next one would be uh, find a way into the basement. Those are all missions. Yeah. And missions can have many missions inside of them, milestones. You can get as detailed and granular as you want. Mm-hmm. Or as overviewed as whatever, you know, as a broad is whatever helps you. Uh, so KV says, I just thought of a great way to practice making GDDs. Try making one for your favorite game. 100%. That is a great way to Do practice. Yes. yes. Find your favorite game and start making the GDD. Two things are going to happen. One, you're going to get great practice in making a GDD. Mm -hmm. Second, you're going to realize the insane amount of work that goes into it. And hopefully, instead of scaring you off, it will prepare you for the organization needed to really create an organized game project. Right. Uh, by the way, don't do what I did with Breath of... Um, not Breath of... <laughs> Book of Shadows. Once I added something to the game, I deleted it from the document. Oh, no. Oh, no, BG. Uh-oh. Yeah, never do that. Yeah. So, the game design document is not a checklist. It is the living source of all documentation in your game. Yeah. BG learned. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the puzzle Same structure. thing. Yeah. Same thing. How are your puzzles structured? Are there puzzles? If so, how are they structured? And write down each one. Yep. So it's like if you have the front lock puzzle, the uh, basement door puzzle, the lament configuration puzzle, write down how they're solved. And write down how they can be failed, if they can be failed, and what mm -hmm. the consequence they're in of. Yeah. Burke, number three, you go insane. Yes. 100% Burke. Um, and then balancing. So here's where we go to those famous spreadsheets everybody loves. Um, describe how the balancing works in your game. Is it auto-balanced by the player's level? Does it change based on the player's skill? Is it set no matter what? Mm -hmm. So that one area is always going to be level 20 as opposed to another area is going to always be level 5? Mm -hmm. You know, that's up to you. It's up to you. But after you put down that balancing and add those formulas, then link to your spreadsheets. Please. And don't try to post a spreadsheet inside of a GDD. You're going to drive yourself crazy. You, you don't like that. You, you do not want to embed no. a spreadsheet into a Word document. Have a hyperlink. Please. Yeah. <sighs> Moving on. Okay, let's move on to mechanics. Want me to take this one or you want this one? Uh, you, why don't you take this one? All right. You love this part. So mechanics is how the game... <laughs> it is. It's how the game actually interacts with itself. What the game does. Uh, physics and controls are the two big ones where you go into... How the physics work? Is it all ragdoll physics? Is it all pre-planned animations? Um, does the game have any... Does gravity take into effect? Does, does it have gravity or not? Can you shout a goat off of a mountain? Or if you shout the goat, does it hit an individual, an in, invisible wall and slide down to the base of the, uh, the mountain path? Over the edge? Or right back onto the path? You choose. Pick mm -hmm. one. That's your physics. Physics would also be, you know, is it low gravity? Can you manipulate gravity? Physics mm -hmm. would be water physics, how that works. How is it like underwater as opposed to above water? Does it slow down when it's raining or snowing? All those things, take that into account. Then the controls. How doth one control their character? Yeah. Does one's character move slower in certain environments, faster in others? Are there things such as conveyor belts that they can go on? All of that. <coughs> Excuse me. XCOM today knocked out someone <laughs> off the edge of wow. a high rise. Yeah. That's hilarious, dude. <laughs> um, then the navigation of the world. Again, this could be anything from walking around to fast travel waypoint systems. Mm -hmm. Take Shadow Hearts and Shadow Hearts Covenant. Um, you go to a world map and you select where it is you're going to go. So you're going to go to uh, Tokyo. You're going to go to the, uh, the small Chinese village. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to Paris. That's how that game did it. Um, then you have games like Breath of the Wild or Skyrim where you just walk you everywhere. Just walk or take a horse. Right. Or you have a horse and cart. Right. Or an airship. Maybe you have a fast travel system mm -hmm. like in Skyrim and, and Fallout. 
Uh, maybe you move through a more tightly functional map, you know, like uh, Dragon Quest XI, waypoints aside, where mm -hmm. you have to go through this area here to get to that area there, and there is no other way. Right. Um, are you on a boat, like in The Wind Waker? That's right. Wind Waker was how, all on a boat. Yeah, how does all that work? That's where navigation comes in. Then there's interactivity. What can you, what can you interact with, and how does it work? Do you have the ability to have, is every item going to have a description? Mm -hmm. um, if not, what items are described? Is it those red books in the bookcases? That's an interactivity element. Yes. Um, can you pick up a pot? Can you smash a pumpkin? Yes, I'm talking about DQ11. <laughs> but that's all interactivity. Can you only, can you interact with NPCs or is it Final Fantasy 13 where you only hear NPCs as you walk by them? That's all important. That's you got to know that. That's all important, yeah. Then the combat and challenge resolution. In other words, is combat and challenge, all those resolved through stats only? Do the players ever use quick time events? Um, you know, is it all driven by choice like rock, scissors, paper? All of that. So everything from combat to any kind of challenge, even those outside of fighting, mm -hmm. how are they resolved? Right. Is it all at the mercy of RNGesus? Or is it RNG with some formulas and buffs? This is where you're going to make those decisions and write them down. And then lastly, your in-game in -game economy. Very important because which I love. you have to have something. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have any in-game economy, 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 economy. <laughs> if you don't have that, then how do the players get things? Are the power-ups just available? Think Super Mario Brothers 3, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, the toad houses where you can get random items. Or you can find things in uh, punch blocks. That's true. Um, I believe there's a Mario game out there where uh, you can buy things with coins. I know you buy things with rupees. Yes, right. In Zelda. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a trading? Is it barter? Yeah. You know? Is it a barter system? Right, where I find a bone here and I can get a club there. Mm -hmm. I don't know why you trade a bone for a club, but here we are. Hey, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Any more thoughts about economies? Uh, yeah, just um, <laughs> when you're developing your economy, you're also going to need a spreadsheet to balance it. There you go. Okay, because... We, we've seen games where uh, there wasn't proper balancing, and um, so you end up spending way too much coin mm -hmm. for a low-level item. Yes. So in-game economy is actually really important to put down, because let's say you're not really good at it, but you you someone on your team is really good with mm -hmm. economy. You're going to have want to have your ideas and everything, your details written down so that they can develop that's right. Your economy. Um, and as Burke said, if it's a larger world, is there an exchange rate? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's that. Too. Is it a loot economy? Like um, Hawks game, Sorbetta, you know, where it's basically the, the drops from the enemies or will give you mm -hmm. money. Right. <laughs> um, maybe universal coinage universal or regions. Universal coinage, right. Yes. You know, do you have to exchange money as you go from area to area and that changes the amount? These are all things to think about. Can you yes, open up a are. savings account at a bank and get a whole bunch of money in return? <laughs> so there it is. There yeah. it is. All right, next, game options. Game Go for options, it. okay. So, uh, main menu options. Uh, list them out. Mm -hmm. All of them. It'd All be like, of them. Like, you know, main menu, continue, load game, uh, settings, whatevers. Right. What all, all your options that yeah. you want them to have yeah. on their main menu. And that includes the options menu, too, wouldn't you? Yes, yeah. it does. It does include the yeah. options menu. Yeah. And then your, your graphics and audio settings. That's right. You need to have a, a, a menu for that. Because you need to know what is it that they control the volume of. Um, mm -hmm. Some games, it's just sound effects, music, and voice. Others, it's things like uh, music, um, sound effects, combat effects, spell effects, footsteps. All of it. Voice. Um, you know, voice your character, voice people talking to you, and mm -hmm. voice pe voices off in the distance. There are games that allow you to control an ass ton of audio and graphical settings. That's right. Textures, shadows, anti-aliasing, etc., etc., etc. All et of it. You know, your, your, your mid-no mode. Is it window yeah. mode or is it full screen? All of it. All those those options need to be set down. Yeah, and gosh forbid you're creating a VR game, then you have to have comfort settings. Mm -hmm. You know, do you snap, uh, you know, when you move, or is it a smooth movement? Do you teleport or do you move, you know, normally by just pushing the thumb pad? You have to have those options in there. You have to there. write all that down. Mm -hmm. uh, your in-game options. Right. Okay, such as I want to... Uh, I want more monsters or less monsters. Difficulty sliders. Difficulty yeah. sliders. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, you want to have your pause menu. Right. Uh, when the player presses the pause button, first mm -hmm. 
Does anything happen? Does anything happen? Does it just open up the end game menu and the game doesn't pause? I'm looking at you every MMO ever made. <laughs> does the game pause? Does the game pause and show a menu or does it just say the word pause, pause on the screen? You need to know all that. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And then lastly, when can you change them? Right. When can what change? Can you only change the difficulty outside of battles? Can you change the difficulty on the fly? I'm looking at you every Bethesda game ever made. Okay. Can you only change? Can you only change the difficulty at the very beginning? Right. You yeah. know, after game start, whatever you're, you're, you're mm. whatever you're stuck with, you're stuck with. Exactly. You, you need to put that down. All of it. Every last bit. Or look at every Souls like except Seikyo because you're always, mm, a danger. always yeah. in danger. Yeah. But yes, the whole point is you need to make these decisions. And that's why you put it in your GDD, so that later on, you're not making a decision that contradicts yourself, or you've forgotten what you decided. Well, you forgot what you decided. And you go, oh, or you look back and go, now that I've been working on the game for five months, I'm realizing that what I wrote in the GDD isn't working, so I'm going to change the GDD. Right. Because you want to change the GDD when your necessity to change the game happens, uh -huh. and you want to follow the GDD when that's necessary. Correct. Again, it's a living document meant for organization. All right, let's go into saving and loading. Saving and loading, loading and saving. Um, so yeah, let me go ahead and just go through this one real quick. Yeah, let's go through this. Because this is not that hard. This is so how does loading from the main menu work? Um, is it on a rotating save or not? You know, uh saving or loading from within the game. How do you do that? Is it all automatic? You know, mm -hmm. uh Dragon's Dogma pisses me off because Dragon's Dogma overwrites your save file every time you do anything. Mm -hmm. And if you drop a manual save, it just overwrites that one save. Um, but how does that work? Um, Bethesda games literally let you save or load anytime. You could save right before you fall off a cliff or get killed and die. Yeah. You can load a game right before you fall off a cliff or get killed and die. Some games don't give you that level of freedom. Dragon Quest XI, you have to go to the statue. Mm -hmm. Or church. Or church. Auto saving and quick saving. Quick saving is a functionality that's a little newer in the industry, and by newer I mean within the past couple of decades, us from the 80s will tell you that didn't happen, where you basically would do a state save right then and there. Yeah. They generally aren't as stable as full saves because of the way scripts work, however that depends on the game and the engine. For example, quick saving in a CD Projekt Red's Cyberpunk 2077 technically should be pretty safe. Yeah. I say technically because the game has bugs. Quick saving in Skyrim and Fallout 4 is actually a good way to corrupt the save file because it doesn't auto start all of your scripts unless you start up a hard save. Correct. So there's a difference. Auto saving is a full save automatically. Yeah, like like a lot of games use it when you enter a new area. Or go to sleep. They just boo -boo, auto save. Or when you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Or when a certain cinematic ends. Yeah. They'll yep. auto save. And yes, save anywhere and everywhere is very handy, but is that the kind of game you're creating? Yeah. Everyone's going to be a little different as to whether they have a save point, save areas, or save everywhere. Then we go to save management, and that is how many slots. For example, mm -hmm. with the Bethesda games we like to talk about, you have as many as you can drop save files, and you just take up hard drive space. Dragon Quest XI has a finite number. Dragon's Dogma had two. Your two. auto save and your manual save. <laughs> and never the tween shall meet. That's right. So, yeah. Um, see, I gotta have save management. How that works, gotta write that down. And then is there a cloud backup? Um, Steam games pretty much back up automatically on the cloud. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're not going through Steam. Let's right. say you're going through your own service. Let's say you're creating an MMO. Let's say you're creating your game with a tapestry like the Dragon Age games. That's right. Then you have to figure out how cloud backup works. If at all. Yeah, and what you're going to use for What you're going to use, exactly. Are you going to use something like Cloudfire or Cloudflare, I think is what it's called? Or are you going to use something else? Or are you just going to pay up uh, for Amazon service? Could you do that too? You can do that too. All right, moving on. All right. Ah, uh, the replaying. <laughs> what makes your game replayable? Write it all down, everything. Is your game replayable? Is it? Some games are not. For example, you could say that Final Fantasy VII Remake, except for getting a few things, isn't exactly replayable. The mm -hmm. replayability is playing on hard mode to get better stuff. Dragon Quest XI is only replayable if you really like the quality of life stuff in the S version. Right. Uh, games like Cyberpunk, once the bugs worked out, are going to be insanely replayable. That's right. So... Yeah, so, yeah. What makes your game replayable, mm -hmm. if at all? 
Uh, also, you want to put down all your player choices and outcomes. So all that stuff you mentioned in the story. Mm -hmm. Now you want to talk how that fits into the replayability. So a good example there would be if we were making the GDD for Dragon Quest Origins. I love picking on that game because it's so good about this. It is good. Hey, Emma, it's good to see you. Don't worry, you'll catch anything you missed on the GD on the uh, VOD of the GDD. The VOD of the GDD. <laughs> I'm awesome. Um, so all that stuff in story you wrote about multiple paths, player choices, etc., etc., etc. You're going to now reference that in this part of the document mm -hmm. and talk about how that adds to replayability. Yeah. Does or d does... Sorry, Bubahotep's distracting me. <laughs> does or does not the game allow you to replay based on things like character origin? Again, mm -hmm. Dragon Age Origins. Choices you make during the campaign. Who you hook up with. Who you piss off. Yeah. Who you side with. Mm -hmm. All of that. And that includes both the player choice and the part below it. Right. Which is the multiple paths. The multiple paths. They all feed into each other. And, of course, multiple <laughs> endings. Yes. And uh, if... if Having multiple endings does make your game replayable. Write it down. Give us yes, much detail. my game is replayable because I have five different endings. Right. And each ending, and then for that also, uh, when we say more detail, do each of those five endings require five separate playthroughs, or can you do it at separate decision points in the game? Right. So you got to write that down too. Or like in the case of Chrono Trigger, you get your multiple endings by, on your second playthrough, defeating Lavos at different points. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and, and then, of course, New Game Plus. Is there one? Is there one? And what what goes into it? What makes it worse somebody replaying? Right. Why, what are you offering? Why in the world? I deleted it. I got it. I got it. Why in the world would the player want to play your entire game again? Mm -hmm. That's what the New Game Plus is for. Um, what's the point? Yeah. So, uh, all of that has to go into the replaying section of your GDD. Right. And yet, you are going to reference earlier stuff. But this is where you focus on the replayability. Shall we continue? Let's continue. All right, cheats. Ah, uh, the cheats. cheats Let's talk cheat, about cheat. cheat deal. Okay, so there are technically only two types of cheats, but they added an extra segment because nowadays, exposing exploits on YouTube is a industry people make money <laughs> off of. <laughs> yes, they do. I'm looking at you spiffing Brit. <laughs> so there are two types of cheats. The first is a developer cheat. This is a cheat that the developers use specifically to get through hard parts of the game and are never meant to be used by the player. You want to write these down for two reasons. One, so you'll know what they are. Mm -hmm. Two, so you can disable them, if possible, prior to going gold. Right. Yeah. Um, second are the intentional cheats. So a lot of times uh, developers, especially nowadays, like to put in cheat codes. Um, mm -hmm. The infamous up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, B, A, start code from Konami, the Konami code. Um, the console from everything Bethesda ever made. Yeah. The Skyrim console is intentional. Yes, it is. Yeah, the Konami code. <laughs> um, so those are the ones. So either you, so you want to write down all the developer cheats that you're going to have to help you and the developers get through the game, um, and then you want to have the intentional cheats that you want the players to kind of figure out a thing. Yeah, a thing. Yes. Uh, seems like a forgotten thing in a GDD now that is video game history. Yeah, a lot of people overlook this part. Uh, but this is something you want to have in. And then the last part are possible exploits. Mm -hmm. These are where you try to play a little bit of a um, fortune teller and figure out places where your game could be exploited, and this would be used by the testers to try to fix or exploit your game. Right. You're never going to get them all, and someone's going to post how to break your game on YouTube. And then you patch your game. And then you patch your game. And then you patch your game. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you want to try to forecast a little bit, knowing how you know how your mechanics work. Saying, hey, my mechanics are pretty solid. Mm -hmm. However, my critical hit system is in such a way that if someone is able to buff the value of a weapon's crit chance over 25, I'm just throwing out a number here, mm -hmm. uh, every hit will be a critical hit. So, so, yeah, you do want to list out all your possible exploits so that later on, all your, your, your bug testers yeah. can go through it. 100%. And mm -hmm. yes, I'm totally having your extra tea later in honor of the spiff. Yeah. All right, here we go. Easter. All right, Easter eggs. Yum, 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 yum. Hey, quick bit of trivia. Anyone remember the first Easter egg in recorded video game history? Uh, do, 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 Mm -hmm. uh, the Atari 2600 had the first recorded. Yes, yep. Grace, Grace has got, got it. it. Grace has got it. <laughs> yes, by uh, Warren Robinson. 
Yes. The man, mm -hmm. the myth, the legend. That's right. Yeah, giving credit to the developer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, but however, since that, Easter eggs have become a thing. Yeah, they are. And Easter eggs can be up to and including now homages to other games. Yes. So you're going to put Easter eggs in your games. Don't pretend that you're not. No one's buying that lie. <laughs> so for this section, list out all the Easter eggs mm -hmm. that you're going to put in your game. Yep, yep, yep. And along with it, how to find them. How do you find them? Just, yeah. Just do it. Um, because again, again, two reasons. One, so you can remember where to put them in. And two, there's nothing wrong with releasing a tweet three months after your game has been out. Uh-huh. With, hey, here's something I heard, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, it regenerates interest in your game. You, you, you got to understand, guys, leaking at the right time is marketing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> My bugs are Easter eggs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then Tinder comes a crawling because they don't leave. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Oh, you can move it on? Okay, ready to move? I think so, yeah. All Easter right. eggs are pretty self-explanatory. So I have a certain magical camera and ghost hunting if I make one. Yeah, pretty much. You should. Pretty much. Hey, when you make Sayaka 3D, have that camera be able to take pictures. And whenever it takes a picture, uh, Sayaka is wearing a cute dress instead of angry ghost dress. There we go. There we go. All right, now let's get to the tutorial level. We we list the tutorial level first because it's usually a more watered down version of your full levels. Mm -hmm. If that's not the case, skip this and have your tutorial level use what's on the next slide. Please go to. Okay, so on a typical tutorial level, you first of all want to have your synopsis. Of what is a level? What is your level? Yeah. What's it about? Mm -hmm. and then you want to have your intro. Which okay. is those first... Those first... A uh, couple of seconds. Yes. Yeah. Then a physical description of the level. And you want to get as detailed as possible, especially if someone else is designing it. Yes. Uh, that includes the inclusion of maps, guys. You can't get away from those. Maps, maps, maps. Yeah. Uh, level flow. Which is... How the, how the level get progresses from right. start to finish. Right, right, right. Your critical path. Which is very important. Because you have to have that path that we've talked we talked about this a we've million times. We've talked about this uh, many times. Many like the last two creator classrooms, which were on two D and three D, mm -hmm. were specifically mentioning the critical path. And then, lastly, all your challenges and solutions right. in your tutorial level. These are the things that you are trying to teach the player. Right, all the way back. So, I mean, this could be anything from a combat situation to avoiding combat, like in a stealth mission, uh -huh. to solving a puzzle. A challenge is anything that's going to act as an obstacle between the player and their goal. Yeah. And it doesn't have to always be combat. It doesn't always have to be a puzzle. It's no, anything. No, it doesn't. It could be anything. Any, it could be it could be going to sleep at the end, you know, at the right time. These are these are things like, you know, having enough money to buy that Neko farm. I'm gonna get mad again. <laughs> <And moving on. laughs> or or as 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 simple as as teaching them to talk to everyone. Yeah, exactly. Walk around and talk to everybody. Exactly. What are the lessons that they have to learn and how do they solve mm -hmm. the problems that you run yeah. across? So, the, again, this is the watered-down version of, of this. Of a, a typical level that you're so, going to be designing. In the game industry, the uh, other DD, other than the GDD, is the LDD. The LDD is a level design document. Yep. It is all of this for every level. That's map of your game, area of your game, Anything in which the character is going to traverse, that is a level. Yes. So each of these... Oh, that's awesome, Boo Boo. I can't wait to see what your game would look like in 3D or VR. Um, so each of your games... So we're going to go... Some of these are going to have similar to what Teal talked about. So you just have your synopsis which of the level. Which is literally mm -hmm. what the level is about. So this is going to be uh, the creepy cave where the bandit king is. And it's, uh, it's right by a river. Right. It's, it's, river. it's a high level overview. Um, then, then your introduction which to is, the level. Which is what the player will see in the first few seconds. So the player emerges or enters into the cave and uh, is in a, a tight space going straight mm -hmm. down into a cavern. That's right. just so that they'll know how it works. And this is introducing the level itself. Then you have your physical description of the level. And this is where you have to get detailed. Well, we didn't talk about it as much in the tutorial side, but on every LDD ever. You have to get very descriptive. Talk about the moss in the trees, the, the the slime on the walls, 
um, talk the, about the, the light. The puddles on the floor, the drip, drip, drip. The light sources, are they from torches? Are they from sunlight coming through, you know, holes in the ceiling? Mm -hmm. Are they coming through glowing fungi? All of that you have to write in a physical description and more. And this is where you would put concept art, if, if necessary, because mm -hmm. not only do you have to have something to reference later when you're making the level, if you ever hand off a level to someone else and you don't have good descriptions and you don't have that LDD filled out, you are not going to get what you want and it's either going to cause a problem between you and your designer mm -hmm. or you're going to get something other than what you want for your game. Yep. The more description and more words you put into the LDD, the level design sections of your GDD, the better. The better. Same thing with the objectives. Objectives. What do they have to accomplish? Mm -hmm. That's all that is. The level flow. How do they get, how do they move along? Do they, are they on a boat? Are they on their feet? Are they walking? Are they flying are they on flying? a- flying? You know, all of that. Um, and then the critical path, which is how they have to get through point A to point B, mm -hmm. as well as- All the optional paths. Which we talk about all the time as being those things that, well, lead you anywhere. Yeah. So treasures. To treasures, or to, to uh, optional monsters, or to a, a piece of lore. Right, points you know, of interest. Points of interest. That that nice little, I, I love that one area in Dragon Quest XI where Teal just walked and it was a cliff and it didn't do anything. Except it showed a beautiful view of Erdria. It Erdria. showed a beautiful view of Erdria. And that was the reward for taking that optional path. So anytime mm -hmm. you have an optional path, what is the reward? Even mm -hmm. if it's just a nice view or conversation between two or characters. Or conversation between two characters. Hey, doesn't this remind you of the glade we had our first picnic in? Why, yes it does, honey. I'm really glad you, I, you I could come with you. That kind of thing. Exactly. That's, that's a reward. Mm -hmm. So, quick question from Burke. As okay. for level designers, are these tightly related to mapping and how would you handle it in 3D maps? For example, screenshots or an overview. Okay. Um, I'll answer and then Teal, if you have anything you want to add on sure. as the level designer. Yeah. Um, so, yes, this does relate to mapping. If you can include a map or a sketch, do so. Screenshots, concept art also can be put on here. You want to give as much uh, pre-prep in your LDD portion, in this portion right here, as you possibly can. Teal, anything to add to that? Um, now I think you pretty much succinctly uh, answered the question. Yeah. Um, you do include mapping in level design, but there's so much more in there than just your map. Right. Uh, Would you so. say that it's a bad idea to fall on, hey, I just put a map of my level, I'm done in the description area, uh, or this whole part? No, that that that's not doing enough yeah. work. What you need to do is, you can include your maps, but also everything else that goes into that level. Yeah. Everything yeah. else. Yeah. The, uh, the, the people, the monsters, the environments, the lighting. Um, gosh, what else? Uh, just there everything everything the the puzzles the challenges so literally at a certain point the uh, rewards you're going to be writing a lot even yeah. in the, even in the level documentation part it's not enough to just slap a concept picture and a map you got to write it all out you've got to write it all out yeah. everything that's going into that level yes um and again the level can be as t small as a cave or mm -hmm. it could be as big as a, a province in a country sure it's whatever it is that the player is going to be moving around in at that point to accomplish whatever part of your narrative it is yeah yeah we know it's subjective and that can get confusing but it's subjective on purpose because you as the developer is the design lead. You're, you're the lead developer of your game. Yep. You decide what a level is. We can't tell you that. Um, great example for that is the Rose and Hearts game now that we're making it in Unreal. The balloon crash site is a level. Yeah. As is Twinkle Twee's tree. That's a level. Those are two levels. However, the rest of the Black Forest in which the girls can get into combat is one it's level. It's one level. So you have a big forest dungeon is a level, but then two separate parts are other tinier maps. Mm -hmm. And those are smaller self-included levels. So oh. that, that's what we mean by that. Yep. Um... Where are we at? Objectives, well, level flow, critical path, path optional path. Important. Okay, important challenges and solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Um, Anything that's stopping <sighs> them to get yeah. along the... So important Anything challenge... Anything stopping you on the critical path. Thank you. Thank you, Teal. <laughs> <laughs> and trivial is anything else. Right. It's not anything... It doesn't have to be optional. It's literally any challenge 
not on the critical path yeah. is considered trivial. That doesn't mean they're actually trivial. It could be a life or death situation, but we're talking about trivial in terms of the level flow. It's trivial if it's not the critical path. Right. Uh, just, do, do you need to do it? Right. Yes or no? Right. Can the player skip that challenge and still complete the map? If so, it's, it's trivial. If so, it's trivial. And then the level conclusion. How can the level end? Yeah. You know, I mean, this can get really linear. Like, a Mario level can only end if Mario jumps on that flag or uh, mm -hmm. knocks Bowser into lava. That's right. Um, you know, Zelda levels only finish when Link beats the boss and gets the Triforce piece. Mm -hmm. Some levels are going to be a lot more, you know, subjective as to yeah. how it ends or a lot more open-ended. Uh, your Skyrim levels, you know, sometimes some of them require you to make choices. Others, you can just leave. You can just abandon. leave, yeah. So it depends, and you got to write all that down. Again, write it all down. Move it on. Okay, now the UI's the user interfaces. User interface. Yes, um, so really simple. Uh, have the user interface for your control systems. What is that? Yeah. You know, what are your control systems? Are your control systems uh, your keyboard bindings, your controller binding? You know, mm -hmm. um, the trackpad if you're going to be using a VR system. Right. How uh, the tracking handles on your VR headset. Mm -hmm. All of that. That's the control systems. Write all that down. A user interface is not just a graphical interface. A lot of people think it is. The interfa user interface is how the user interfaces with the game. Yeah. So part of that is the control system. Then there's the camera. Is it always a third person camera? Is it a first person camera? Always does the two switch. And the two switch. Does it ever need to switch? Mm -hmm. And if so, how? Is it user controlled or is it game controlled? Um, is it a static camera that just follows the user, like a lot of the Silent Hill games? Mm -hmm. the, that camera never follows Heather Mason, I believe, in Silent Hill 3. It just rotates and she moves off and then another camera picks up. Um, other cameras follow you around. Yeah. Um, you know, and then have an idea of whether or not those cameras are going to clip through walls and that needs to be looked at. Yeah. You know. And uh, also, um, there, there are times when... <clears throat> You can switch your camera. I, I want to switch the X and Y axis. Right. I want my when, when I press down, I want the camera to go up. Yeah. Rather than pressing down, the camera looking down. Really good example. Um, you know, pressing a button in an RTS, mm -hmm. uh, allowing you to zoom in on one area where one of your uh, troops are moving, as opposed to pushing another button and looking at the whole battlefield. Exactly. Um, in uh, Sims. Sims is a good one too. You can you can change. Uh, your camera type. I want them in Sims 4. You can have the Sims 4 camera, or you can select. I want the Sims 3 camera. Mm -hmm. I want the camera that behaved a certain way in Sims 3. Mm -hmm. um, you can change that. Valkyrie Chronicles. Uh, I've only played the original one, but in Valkyrie Chronicles, when you're looking at the overhead map uh, during a battle, you're looking at a sketched map that looks like a war map in mm -hmm. you know uh, an old uh, World War One, World War Two, you know uh, bunker. And then as soon as you select your troop, it zooms in on the character in the 3D world, and you're moving through, shooting, and trying not to get killed. Yeah. The so cameras. Very important. I know we spent a lot of time on that just now, but people underestimate cameras a lot, and it always bites them in the ass. Yeah. Uh, menu systems. Menus. How do they look? Yeah. And, you know, this is all tying into that visual theme thing we have mentioned in uh, our visual theme in the creator details, classroom. In right. Yeah. And in our visual systems. theme classroom, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like the, uh, the 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 map, the sorry, the uh, menu systems in Kingdom Hearts very recognizable because it's a certain blue. The same thing with mm -hmm. Final Fantasy, it's a certain blue. Yeah. Um, and that moves into the HUDs and the mini maps. Do you have them? If so, what information's on them? Mm -hmm. And how do they look? You know, uh, Kingdom Hearts too. It changes per world. Yes, it does. Uh, the HUD for Fallout Four looks like the LCD monitor of your Pip Boy. That's right. All of these. Things. And you can change the color uh -huh. of your HUDs. You can mm. change it from orange to blue to mm. pink. What's customizable? Yeah. All these things have All to be All that has down. to be put into this section. And if you have screenshots or concept art or mock-ups, mm -hmm. put them in here so that anyone looking will say, oh, that's how it's supposed that's to look. That's how it's supposed to look. I got this. Mm -hmm. And you, then your UI artist can go, okay, now I know what they're trying to do. I have my color palette here from my color theory, et cetera, et cetera. All this stuff written down. I can make the boss UI yes. that they're asking for. Mm -hmm. um, when we did the uh, RPG Maker MV version of Rosen Hearts, we actually had a High Blitz, I think it was High Blitz, yeah. create our uh, our HUD. Yes. And we just said, that we gave him a document. So this is what we want. This and this, this and this and this. And he said, I got gotcha. you. And we came out with that gorgeous HUD. So, yeah, the more detail you put in, the better Absolutely. your product. Absolutely. 
uh, help system. Same exact thing. Oh, yeah. How does it look? How does it function? Is it branching? Do you open it up like you would open up a FAQ? Mm -hmm. Right. Is it, you know, certain questions or topics? Um, Trails of Cold Steel has a help system in a certain way. It's very different than, like, my favorite game, Skyrim. Yeah. They're all different. They're different. And then finally, the UI visuals and the audio. You know, yeah. when you move through the UI, is there a sparkle effect as you change menus? When you click on something, does it, you know, flare up and then flare down? What sound does your... Is there UI a little make? sound effect, mm -hmm. like chimes or right. um, a woodpecker? I yeah. I mean, you just, you, you need to have that listed down. If you want a certain audio with, with uh, your player moving through your UIs, mm -hmm. write it down. So if you're thinking to yourself right now, I don't usually think about these kind of things, you're okay. Most new developers don't. That's why we're showing you this because there's so much you can, you need to consider mm -hmm. that you may never have considered. So write it all down. Okay, now going into the details. So now we're going into the nitty gritty. Engine, yes. This is really important because you can shoot yourself so hard in the foot yeah. that your game becomes unrecoverable. Burke will know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And anyone who has worked on cross versions of RPG Maker, MV, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will know. First, note your game engine in the version. If you're making your game in Unreal version 4.2.5, write that shit down. And then copy and paste the version notes from whatever documentation you have. That's right. Go to Epic site, post from there. Yeah. Go to Decica's site, post from there. You need that information. What is the most relevant version notes? And then finally, what is the highest level you can upgrade that engine to before you'll break your game? Because, yeah, well, we're getting there. We're getting there, Griffin. We're getting there, Griffin. We're getting there, Griffin. Yeah. Plugins are coming. Yeah. Um, This will break your game. Changing your engine, or I'm sorry, upgrading your engine version past what your game can handle mm -hmm. will break your game. Don't, and it, rolling that back is so hard. Oh, yeah. So save yourself the headache. Stay on the engine version you're at. Don't go above whatever the recommendation is. Yeah. And now we're going to go to game programming. There we go, game programming. And that's what Griffin was talking about. Yes, plugins. So first, any programming languages that are used. Is it all the internal scripting like Unreal's Blueprints and mm -hmm. uh, the plugin system for RPG Maker MV slash MZ? Or are you writing in C++ and C Sharp? Who knows? Yeah. Oh, my dude! Yay, it's Graceless Subscribe! Woohoo! Subscription, three months. Two to three months in advance for... Oh. 10 months. Oh my god. Awesome. Oh my god, dude. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, I gotta post a thank you. Hold on. Boop. All right. Dude. <laughs> dude, he raised his tier raised to tier his two. Tier to tier. He's now a tier two. Dude, that means he's a slime tastic supporter. He can chat with us on yeah. Tuesdays. Yeah. Thank you, man. So he did it three months in advance. Graceless, you're amazing. Yeah. Thank you, man. Um, let's jump back in. Okay, so programming languages. So not only that, you also want to talk about your in-house plugins and scripts. These are the ones you develop. So we'll list out all those plugins, like Griffin said. List them all out. Yeah. Also list out the third-party ones you've either paid for or gotten for free. Yeah. You know, like uh, you got Yanflies. Yeah, Yanflies. So exactly. Then you need to list that down. I used a plugin from Yanfly. Not listing the plugins you own list the plugins you use yeah because i've seen someone do that well i have all these programs all these plugins are you using them all no then don't list them. don't list it <laughs> and i don't mean that in a condescending way it's kind of silly um but yes if you're whatever plugins you're using list them and here's the thing do not remove them from the gdd if you stop using them instead either put like a strike through or put down deactivated on and put the date yeah make a note yeah and I, I actually prefer notes over, over strike throughs. I just put a note out there in parentheses and I bold it. Um, removed <laughs> on 4 3 19. Yep. Due to blah. Right, exactly. Documentation is very important. Mm -hmm. Teal does get granular with I that. I do. I do. The notations. Um, and then a version list and upgradability for everything. Um, so you're using Yanfly's Combat Core version of. And can you upgrade it at all without breaking your project? Yeah. There you go. Need to know. <laughs> that way, if it's easier to roll back plugins and scripts than it is to roll back the game engine. <laughs> the so, engine. <laughs> you know, a little more forgiving. Yeah. So now we move on. Ah, <laughs> uh, the game AI. All right. So, um, details here for the game AI. Lots we, of details. We had an entire creator classroom. Mm -hmm. 
on game AI. Yes. And we highly recommend every one of you go see it. Um, if you're going to be doing any AI programming outside of stuff from plugins. Yeah. Um, in fact, we actually recommend you watch it anyway because people keep thinking that AI is one thing and it's not, it's another. But first thing you want to do is you want to write down your overview and your methods. So that's how the algorithms work. You don't have to write down the algorithms here. In fact, if your algorithms are really big, you can link to them. Just link to them. But yeah. how does the AI work? And then after you write that overview and the methodology being used, write down what the friendly AI does, the neutral AI, and the hostile AIs out of combat and in combat. What do they do? How is targeting decided? What changes states? Again, you don't have to write down your algorithms, but write down your, and every single programmer is going to know what I'm talking about, your pseudocode. Yeah. You can write down your pseudocode here. If this, then that. And, you know, be as detailed as you feel you need to be. Um, obviously, you're going to have some level of documentation, or you're going to have your algorithms written out, or your code written out. Yeah. You can link back to that if you have it, like, on GitHub or on your computer. But make sure you write down exactly how that AI works. Now, what I don't have listed on here, and I'm kind of slapping myself on the hand because we mentioned it in the old creator classroom. Write down any non-character AI, like environmental AI, yes, environmental lighting AI, AI. Mm -hmm. sound AI. Because all of that, as we go over in our classroom, is AI. Uh, yes, uh, what both Burke and Rack are saying. Logic instead of the code? Exactly. The pseudocode is the logic. Uh, and state maps. Um, yes. Are those, uh, what's it called? Finite state maps? Yes. The yeah. F SFMs. Um, those are also good. All of that here. And then you can link it to the actual code later on if you have, to, if you have a repository. Mm -hmm. So good stuff. Let's move on. The game art. Game art. Okay. This is where you're going to put down all the details of your, your visual. Mm -hmm. You want to put down your art style. Okay. Such as, is it cartoony? Is it um, hyper-realistic? Mm -hmm. um, is it, let's say it's, it's art deco or it's a uh, 1930s cartoon style. You, you need to put that style down. And Teal, would you say that this right here is the section to put in the color palette chosen through color theory? Yes, it is. So the first section. Yes, you want to put down your uh, color palette. Okay. Complementary colors, etc. Yes. Okay. You because, refer, refer to our color theory creator classroom on that. Because that leads you to your visual themes. Right. Okay. Based on your art style, your uh, color selection that sort of thing that's how you're going to form your visual themes mm -hmm. and you put right all that down and then that leads you to the concept art mm -hmm. you're going to want to have a, a concept artist you need to write everything down that you want so your concept artist can actually draw it out or uh, link it to your libraries if your concept artist already has. Mm -hmm. So it's a little kind of a dance between description and linking libraries, right? Right, it is. Yeah. Uh, then you want to put down uh, as much detail as you can on your environment. Same thing, yeah. It's concept art, environments. Uh, th this is all how the art is going to look. So, mm -hmm. you know, the environments are all drab. You know, uh, the swampy areas, like if you're describing the swamps of uh, southern Louisiana, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, willow trees with an oversaturation of water and um, you know tight air tight waterways that can only be moved on 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 shallow boats because the the ground of the bayou is not that far from the water surface. Mm -hmm. You would write all that in and all then link it. to any any additional libraries, uh, visual libraries, pictures. Right, and then uh, characters. Mm -hmm. How do your characters physically look? Yeah. Um, and and, and the, the clothing, what kind of clothing they wear. If there's changes of clothing, then what is each outfit? Yeah. Like, you have to write all that down because uh, down the line, either you or somebody else is going to have to design this. Yeah. And is it a dynamic clothing, like it changes as you change equipment? Or is it static clothing or costume changes? Yeah. Like JRPGs love to do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, characters, it's not just people. Right. It's also uh, animals mm -hmm. and uh, monsters. Monsters. Basically anything that moves on its own volition that's alive, mm -hmm. the character. And then uh, the objects yeah. that you're, you're non-living uh, 
Right. Yeah, trees. Trees, clouds, flowers, clouds, swords, rocks, sword chucks. Mm-hmm. All of it. And then um, any any miscellaneous um, art. To, to is what can you think of a miscellaneous um, I mean, weather mis patterns weather yeah weather patterns that's a good example yeah. it always fugs it into environment I'm, I'm on the spot there <laughs> but I mean it's if it doesn't fit any of those other places then put miscellaneous then just put it miscellaneous yeah. but this this is the place that you're putting all your visual yes. stuff for the, this game the game art itself mm -hmm. and as Teal was saying descriptions and or links to libraries yeah. So I'm going to address with both great. I'm going to address Pablo Hotep as a cute statement, but let's talk about Gracelesses for a second. Graceless asks about recommended programs or apps. Um, we use primarily for Rosenhearts, Evernote, and MS Word. You can use Artisy Draft, which is a great GDG, GDD maker. Yeah. Um, we actually own it. We just guilty confession time. We haven't used it as much as we should. But uh, Artisy Draft is a good one. Um, Scrivener is good if you're going to do things more on the writing side, like a script. Yeah. Um, in fact, use Scrivener for your for your game script. Just use Scrivener for your game script. Um, so those are the ones. But we use Evernote because we can sync it between the two of us, and Word because we're old school. Yeah. But um, okay, and then Graceless. I'm not Graceless, but Bahotep costume changes for Naomi and Sayaka. Um, yes, do it. Change your characters' costumes. We have costume changes for Naomi and Victorian Rosenhearts. Yeah. Um, as the girls either going out to a nice place, they're going to dress in uh, more formal dresses. If they're visiting someone, they're going to wear uh, more day dresses. If they're going out in, their, in, in a place where they can get hurt, they're going to wear their combat clothes. So, yeah, do it. Do Naomi and Sayaka. In fact, have it be that they're unlocked during the course of the game and people can play it in some subsequent playthroughs. Unlockables are awesome. Right. Um, and Burke says, I just posted some location concept art from Vividis Contest SB Chat. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Burke. Absolutely. That's awesome. Let's move on. Okay. Okay, now we go from visual to audio. So the please don't forget the sound. Exactly the same treatment. Let me go ahead and take this. Yeah, one. go ahead and take that one. So what is the RL theme? It's like the visual theme, except it's you know audio. So you know if your visual theme for let's, let's pick one of my favorite games. Let's mm -hmm. pick Persona Five. The visual theme for Persona Five is very noir. It has that comic book yeah. you know hard contrast black, white, red coloring with some yellow and other things thrown in for accents. The aural theme fits that. It feels like a noir style, you know, thief thing. It just feels noir. And even down to the, the slight bluesiness of the battle music last surprise. Yeah. It just has this feel and this sound to it and you know what you're looking at and hearing. So you want that for both your game, you know, visually and aurally. Mm -hmm. Write it down. Then write down what type of background music you have. Is the background for Eternal Sonata? I would write down background music inspired by the works of Frederick Francois Chopin. Yeah. Is highly orchestral, using the piano as the main source of uh, of the beat, etc., etc. Yeah, et cetera, it's cetera, the main instrument. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, the main instrument. Um, and if you have links to the music, you know, if you have links to sample music. Oh, that's or, that's really good. Having links to sample music. If you have a composer and you can say, hey. Here's what I want my music to sound like, but this, that will help them. There's going to be so much guitar in your game. <laughs> Environmental audio, list that too. You know, um, uh, for the Cypress uh, Woods, the, for the, the bayou down in southern Louisiana, uh, you can hear the uh, the sound of crickets and cicadas. You can hear... Um, the, the, the Kind of the, the flow of water. Yeah. Um, the uh, floop of catfish as they go flooping by. Mm -hmm. the, the buzz of mosquitoes. Uh-huh, the occasional... From a moccasin. Yeah. It's next. Um, and then sound effects. List all those. Same thing with the menu sounds. If it's a if it's a sound that can be made in the game, list it. And if you have a library link to it, link to it. And that is the same thing with menu sounds and voice acting. Yeah. Now we're gonna get to the script in a second, but for voice acting, you want to list each character that has vocal lines and how their voice should sound. If you already have a voice actor assigned to that role. List it there. Yes. For ex yeah, time for Foley cutting cabbage. Yes. Um, so, for example, for the Rosenhearts, we have how we want Victoria and Naomi's voices to sound. If and when we put a VA to those roles, we'll write down the name as well. Right. So, think about that. Normal Japanese horror and have the part unlock Whoopi glasses. That'd be adorbs. Do it. Yes. Yeah. Like Burke said, always a yes. <laughs> okay. Can we move on? Yeah. Joe? Okay. All right. 
the technical specs. Technical specs. Um, this is often also overlooked, both on a GDD and a general testing level by new devs. And then you have problems with phasmophobia and it's really not very well optimized levels for like free builds. Yeah. But you can fix that. First, write down what your target hardware is. If you don't know what that is, if you don't know what target hardware you should be aiming at, figure it out. Look at other games. Google games that are similar to the ones you're making and see what the, the recommended hardware is for those. It's probably around the same thing. If you're using an engine that requires at least X number of CPU and graphics cards, you know because you're using that engine, you have to have at least that hardware. If you're going to go with ray tracing, you need an RTX card to turn on that feature, etc., etc. Right. So then the next thing you want to do, and again, cannot overstate this enough, is you want to FPS test on your systems. About the time you get to the late beta, but definitely before you go gold, you want to start FPS testing. And you want to do it on multiple systems, which mm -hmm. means you find testers who have different types of systems. And you can test it on everything from a laptop to a rig, like what Studio Blue has. You need to see what the range is and what the FPS is under normal and high load situations for your game. Yeah. And yes, even if you're using a 2D engine like RPG Maker, you have to do this because we've run into that problem. Yeah. Maybe one of your scripts conflicts with the engine. Maybe one of your scripts conflicts with a certain type of CPU. You're not going to know until you test. Test, test, test. And if you don't have the equipment, find someone who does and is willing to do it either for free or for a low cost. All you need is about an hour worth of data. That's all you need. And then lastly, are any external libraries needed? I can't tell you how many times I've been annoyed at having to install another runtime of Visual C++ mm -hmm. and I didn't know about it in advance. So if you need any external libraries, put a notice in your game, put it in your GDD, then put it on the release note so people know, hey, this requires you to download this version of .NET, this version of Visual C, etc., 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 etc. All right, so now we're getting near the end. Um, you want to talk about the design plan design or you want me to go over plan. that Design plan, okay. You got it or you want me to do it? Uh, I can do it, okay. and you can just throw out commentary as needed. <laughs> as Steels often want to do. <sighs> The, the, this is going to get you organized on the workflow. Yes. Uh, you want to list out all your team members. Every last And one. their roles. Do not leave a single person out. You are the lead designer. You, that's what you are. Mm -hmm. As a solo developer, you are the lead designer. Um, it used to be called the game designer, but they've changed that now. They have changed that, yeah. But you are the lead designer or lead developer. If you're in a massive team, you'll be called a creative director. But you're the lead designer. And then, as I said, everybody gets listed out and what they do. And that includes your bug testers. Even if they've done only one thing. Everybody. Then, this is your production phase. This is your workflow from your proof of concept all the way to gold. <laughs> you have to... That... that that your phases. Right. So what okay. is your proof of concept phase? Yep. What is your virtual vertical slice phase? What is your alpha, early alpha? What mm -hmm. is your alpha? What is your beta? What is your late beta? All of it. What is your, if you do silver, which I mean, silver is just late beta. Mm -hmm. What is your gold? And what is it from gold to release? Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Then you want to put in there your testing milestones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so... Why don't you talk a little bit about testing Well, the testing milestones are when you're testing from late beta to gold, what you have to achieve in checkoff. So it would be like, testing milestone would be uh, no critical crashes. Testing milestone, no FPS below 30 drops. Uh, testing milestone would be no broken quests, etc., etc. Right. That's a testing milestone. And that's so your QA department or QA helpers or one QA person who said they would help you and is regretting it um, will know where to go. Yeah. And what to do, what to shoot for. And then when we say minimum for release, what is the minimum amount right. of, of game? Right. And so bugs. To speak, bugs. Yeah, whole nine yards. That is okay for, for releasing. Yeah, in other words, um, we won't release the game until the game is crash proof, no quests are broken, and the game won't drop below 30 FPS. Right. Um, but everything else we can fix um, after post. We fix it in post. We can fix, fix it, it in post. Fix it after release. Now, do not be lazy here. This is where it gets abused by a lot of AAA companies. Mazda. Mm-hmm. Or, or like Burke said, CD Projekt Red and mm -hmm. Cyberpunk. Yes, 
correct fix. Cor yes, test, correct, fix. So don't use your minimum for release as an excuse to not do the work. Thank you. Ever. And then uh, if you're going to have an early access plan, write it down. Mm -hmm. How early is early access? And how's the release? How is it going to be released? Mm -hmm. Who gets it? So that's an important thing because early access, thank you Valve, has become a major freaking thing. Mm -hmm. And you can generate income on your game before it's finished via early access. But if you want to be taken seriously, if you don't want to be seen as vaporware, and if you don't want to piss everyone off, including Studio Blue, have a freaking plan. People will understand that your game is in early access if they see a plan for completion and release. Exactly. So have that plan written down. I am going to release my game, my five chapter game, in one chapter as a piece. And I'm not going to create new content until each chapter is as bug free as it can be. And then show how that's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, silly question. Shoot. Okay, 60 FPS if it's 3D, 30 FPS if it's 2D. Um, and I only say that because you can't really tell really high FPS 2D games, but if there's any 3D graphics at all, even if it's a fake 2D, uh, 60 FPS. Right. 100%. And then as part of your design plan, you want to put in your marketing milestones. Yeah. Because as I've said before in our um, project manager workshop, right. you do not want to start, start your marketing too soon. Never. Oh, no. oh my gosh. The vaporware so many is people real. have made mistakes mm -hmm. with starting their marketing before they've even gotten out of alpha. There you go. And you need to have a realistic bunch of milestones starting from beta. Yeah. And that needs to be put down in your design plan so that you can follow that as closely as you can. Because the best time is, as Teal said, beta. Mm -hmm. Um mid to late beta and definitely most of your marketing is going to go from goal to release yes it is that is where 90 percent of your marketing is going to be and you want to put that down what mm -hmm. type of marketing how you're going to market who's going to market and and when they're going to do it and pretty much everything burke just wrote yeah duke nukem ff15 mm -hmm. ff16 anthem mass effect andromeda yes don't market too quick please don't please don't Okay, the install and upgrade. I'll talk about this because... Please talk about it. This yeah. is a, this is often also overlooked. Yes, you can slap your game on Steam and not worry about it, but you still have to have the game installed. You still have to have the right files there. Hey, if your RPG Maker game is going to go on Steam and you have a single file missing, Steam isn't going to know that. Steam is just going to install a game that's going to break as soon as the player hits the play button. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, take that into mind. What are the installation methods? And uh, if so, how do they work? What can break? Mm -hmm. uh, is there external install software? There used to be an actual install software you could buy. Like I think Install Shield was one of them. Install in the Shield was yeah. one. Yeah, I remember and you could that. Use, nowadays it's just make it a zip file or use a, a site's install software. Mm -hmm. But you may still have to use something like that. And you two need to behave. Burke and Bubahotep about to get spankings. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> Um, Upgrade methods. How does the game get upgraded? How does it get patched, as it were? Yes. How do you version it? Is it versioned automatically? Um, is it versioned through, like, the Windows Store? Uh, the creator of Immortal Sins, uh, Ace of Aces, is amazing at his use of, I think, .NET to create a auto-updater through the Windows Store That's right. for his RPG Maker game. And that is mind-boggling that he's able to do that by himself. We're going to go through Steam. Yeah. Rosenhearts is going to go through Steam because we don't know what we're doing as far as upgrading goes. I looked at what it takes to upgrade over uh, your own your mm -hmm. own your own servers, and I went, nope, not doing it, not doing it. So yeah, but we have it down in our documents yes. that uh, our upgrade method is going to be via Steam. Yes, yes, um, and then rollback version. Ace's upgrade method isn't it is it is it is, it but is. it's amazing. Amazing, he did it himself. Um, rollback versions. Can you roll back? Or can you, you know, uh, opt out of, mm -hmm. of upgrading? Yeah. You know, some games don't allow for that. They require the update before they'll run again, like on Steam or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Others will absolutely allow you to roll back. Sure. Or, or say, I don't want to go above this version. You have to know that. You need to put that down. Got to write it down. And same thing for beta. Can your player opt into a beta of your game? Correct. And if so, what does that entail? All that has to be written. Down. All that has to be written down, yes. A lot of writing. Moving on next one here's not the plan but the schedule this is the calendar guys so so you have your phases yes. in, in your design 
schedule you you put your phases down yep, yep. now you're going to apply these phases to an actual calendar and it's proposed so don't worry if you don't hit it you're the people who are actually going to make the schedule if you're not an indie solo dev mm -hmm. is going to be the person who owns the studio mm -hmm. or the executives that own the triple a studio right however you need to have a proposed schedule yeah. so what are the points again okay so uh proof of concept to alpha so that's basically from the point you go here's what the game ha is going to be to the past the planning stage which is early alpha mm -hmm. to the actual construction of the game to actually making the game which is alpha and mm -hmm. then you have your whole we call the alpha phase so everything from beginning of alpha to beta which is the creation of your game with features mm-hmm Okay. Including placeholders. Including placeholders. And then the next phase is beta to gold. Now notice we have beta, which includes late beta. So beta is putting in those placeholders, refining those features. And then late beta is the testing phase. That's right. To gold, which is, boom, this is the gold release. This is what we're going to use. I shouldn't say release. The this gold is version. What we're, this is the gold version. This is what, this is our finished product right here. Mark it. Go. But it's not over, because you still have that final month or so between gold and release. Mm -hmm. CD Projekt Red, take a note from this. So instead of developers take note, CD Projekt Red, take note. What happens after gold? Gold to release. And That's what do right. you do from gold and release? What do you do between gold and release? You test the shit. Test, test, test. Test it, break it, put it back together. Find as many bugs as you can while the marketing team is marketing and showcasing you at E3 with Keanu Reeves. This is your last chance to fix your game. This is it, because the next part is the release. And once you release and you go to post-release, if you are a good game developer, all you're doing is fixing bugs that are found mm -hmm. that you didn't know about and upgrading the game to be more playable and better yeah that's it that's all you're doing and of course dlc because mm -hmm. dlc is not included so there you go yeah that's the proposed schedule and then finally and this is the last slide on this part the asset list asset list so this is a list this is where you list everything. This is your comprehensive list of every single asset that you have used, that you will use in your game. So somebody mentioned earlier, I always put down the assets that I use for my game, including the designer of it. Like, you know, am I using uh, Olivia's plugin? Am I using uh, Visualtella's um, asset pack one? Mm -hmm. Am I using the free DLC from Degaka? All this goes here. All that goes here. Everything. This is your documentation. Yeah. All of it, art and animation, sound and UI, special effects code and plugins list every single thing mm -hmm. yeah if you can link to dropbox please do so please do so yeah and then lastly this is where you either link to or print out your full va scripts we mentioned it earlier yes we did here it actually is full va scripts all of it yeah because your voice actors need to have lines and please get if you if you're not good at writing out um what you want your characters to say just get a get a writer Get a writer to do it. Because... Have an editor review it. As we've seen from watching Saber Sparks videos, uh, having badly written out dialogue in a game is bad enough. Having badly written out and spoken dialogue. That's the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you'll end up on a um, Jim Sterling video. Yeah. <laughs> so all of that goes here under asset list. Exactly. Um, so you're writing a lot of stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot. It really is. Um, we're done, and the slime is tuckered out, because I think we overdid it for him. I think so. Uh, but if anyone has any questions, because this is a Th lot. This, this is, as we said, a your very, very comprehensive yeah. design document. Everything goes in this document. Mm -hmm. Everything about your game. I should, I should be able to walk into Bubahotep's house, yes. grab up his GDD, mm -hmm read it and know exactly mm -hmm. what kind of game how it runs everything about his game so, everything so you hear that booba hotep that's what that's what's happening <laughs> that's what's happening um if it's not in your game design document <laughs> then it shouldn't be in your game which means that if you have to have it in your game 
put it in your GDD. Thank you. Remember, it's not exclusive. You don't automatically exclude something because it's not in the GDD. You add it to the GDD. You add it to the GDD. The, as we said, it is a living document. Whatever is put into that game is put into your GDD. So uh, one thing you have to consider too is, oh my God, do I have to open up a document and write all this before I start working on my game? No. No. No, you add no. it in while you get through the proof of concept and early alpha phase. Yes. So while you're doing all of this, you're writing the beginning of it. And then when you're in the alpha phase and you're creating, you're adding to it. Mm -hmm. And you keep adding to it. And you never really stop until your game is gold or release or sometimes even post-release. Because mm -hmm. you may be adding your DLC in. Yeah. Over and over again. Mm -hmm. And Griffin's absolutely true. Learn to touch type. If you're hunting and pecking, it's going to suck. You're you're going to take a yeah. much longer time yeah. than if you touch type. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Touch type. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's... And if you haven't looked at our project manager management workshop, take a look at that. That's going to keep you on track, time-wise. There's a reason why for this VOD we're going to include every relevant major mm -hmm. creation uh, creator class we've ever done. Yeah. Because this ties in everything together. This is the glue for a developer. Yeah, it is. So any other questions? Because Burke's question uh, should be self-evident. This is Teal. She gets anywhere she wants to go. <laughs> she kicks down doors for those pots and pumpkins. I do. <laughs> but yeah, any questions from the audience? Uh, mm -hmm. If not, we will end on an amazing announcement. And then if Hawk is still streaming, we'll raid him. But we don't want you to go anywhere just yet. So if you have any questions, ask them. Otherwise, we have an announcement that especially our older fans will love. Right. Yeah. Sass. So let's, let's have a minute or two <laughs> for questions. I'm telling, and, and you know, if you can't think of a question now, that's okay. Um, hit us up in, in comments. Hit us up on a uh, uh, Discord. All of it. 100%. Uh, we we are here for for you guys. Yeah, we really are. We love and, you guys so much. Uh, we're not the only ones on our Discord that know about GDDs and can construct them. So post your questions on there. There's a lot of folks out there who've done this, and they'll be happy to give you tips and tricks. Uh, no, we don't, but I'm going to post these slides, and what I'll probably do is just make like a Google Doc mm -hmm. and just list it out as a template KV, um, because we don't really do templates. We, we believe that you should instead uh, work with what you feel is right, but if you want this in a list with sections and sublists and stuff, I, there's no reason why we can't do that's that. That's fine. Yeah, that, that's that's like 15 minutes of work, and if it helps you guys out, yeah, 100. I'd give you 30 or 40 without even blinking. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And no. a template could be a, a good starting point for yeah. you. Again, I just want to re reiterate: please do not go online and buy a template from somebody. That's just you're throwing your money away. Holy Don't do it. shit. Thank you for the gifted subs, Graceless. Wow. Graceless has gifted Bubahotep, Fancy Mustelid, KV, Zimsy, and Ventus. And I got an emote, which I'll click right here. Wow. I know we're gonna be getting some Willy Wonka going on Goodness right now. Goodness gracious. Happy New Year from Graceless. I'm serious, man. This is like <laughs> Christmas New Year all over again. Yeah. God, that is awesome, guys. Waiting until the end so interrupt. Awesome. Awesome. Um, damn. Just, oh, that's awesome. This is great. See, we love you guys, and we never ask for a lick of money, but the fact that you guys do this just fills our hearts with joy. Thank you for helping. Yeah. Because it does help. It does. As you can see, our next thing that's going on is uh, we're... Oh, God, my brain's exploding. <laughs> um, we have these... We, we have our mics right now set up on little stands that come with the Yetis, and sometimes we actually hit the table. Yeah, we like do. That. So we're going to be getting those little arms next. That's the next upgrade to the yes, studio. Yes, it is. And then we can position the mics a lot better yeah. so that uh, our sound comes out much better yeah. than just having the mic sitting here, and I actually have to lean forward right. or lean back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so Booba, whoever redemption, you want okay. to say it since since we didn't do Booba's interest, do you want to read this one? I'll go ahead All and right. read it. Booba Hotep will make Sayaka in the Unreal Engine and will start working on it in 2021. We're holding you to Woo! it. Yes. And Burke just wants to have the vertical slice ready, be torn apart on Q. Yeah, second quarter. All right. <laughs> since we don't have any other questions coming, I'm going to go ahead and make the announcement. We have a big announcement for you guys. So um, we always are looking for ways that we can help you guys out and be a part of the community and outreach. And we have looked at the creator classrooms and we feel this is a good place to put a pin on the classrooms for a moment. Right. For now. 
um, we will continue to teach. Don't worry, that's not going anywhere. But back in the day, we had a wonderful thing that we had to stop due to editing time. And starting in 2021, in about February, mm -hmm. about, yeah, February, we're bringing back our podcast DLC, not included. That's right. So taking the place of the Creator Classroom for now will be our podcast, which will be live. Yes. And in the podcast, we are going to talk about a variety of topics, mm -hmm. and we are going to go and just talk about game development and different ways that you know game development can be tackled. And since we're now really know a lot of people in the community, we're going to start having guests. Yes, we will. We'll have uh, guests, uh, live guests, and yeah. uh, we will make it so that it's... Um, yep, it would be about an hour long. Yeah, about an hour long. And we'll be pushing to iTunes and other places as well. So originally, DLC not included, there was about eight of them. Mm -hmm. um, and we had to stop because it was like literally six hours, four to six hours for me to edit. Um, since we're doing it live, we're a lot better extra imp impromptu speaker. Thank you. <laughs> we're a lot better at that than we've ever been. So yeah. we, we now feel that we can do it without having to do heavy editing. Um, and since they're an hour long, they'll be bite sized. So they'll go on YouTube, but they're also going to go on all of those uh, podcast sites. Yes. So you can download them on your phone and listen to them. And we feel at this point, that's going to be better than the structured classrooms for now. For now. And then we can figure out another way to actually send those classrooms out to you guys, uh, whether it be um, YouTube, Udemy, it doesn't matter. We'll figure out how to do that later yeah. for the more structured approaches. But you guys loved DLC Not Included. The, 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 you it, all were It was ate very up. popular. Very much. Um, a lot of people expressed their, their sadness and regret when we had to stop doing them. Right. So uh, we have found a way to pick them back up again. Mm -hmm. And it's basically going to be <laughs> what I call a coffee talk for an hour. Yeah. You know? So our AMA is the adult beverages and uh, the podcast is going to be? A coffee. So we're looking forward to in uh, February of 2021, the return of DLC Not Included, the yeah. Studio Blue podcast. I think this is a good point to call this it. This is a good point to call it. And <laughs> we have so much slime support. We love you guys so very, very much. There has... Never been a moment that Teal and I have never enjoyed doing this. We just, we love you guys. Yeah, we, we have a lot of fun doing this. This will be our final Studio Blue uh, stream for the, for the year. Yes. Uh, we will pick up this Friday, which is the first when we're going to have our AMA. And it'll be our New Year's uh, AMA. We'll have a Degica stream tomorrow night. And uh, we hope you guys have a wonderful New Year. So we love you too, guys. And if you like what you saw, leave the smack down the like button below. Subscribe to our channel. Consider supporting us on Patreon. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Discord. And we'll see you in the next video. See you next time.